During our radio frequency EPR experiments, one thing we found that made a significant difference to increasing our signal to noise ratio is using these solenoidal resonators instead of these modified loop gap resonators, which is what is more commonly used and so what our team was using before. So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk you through how we use these solenoidal resonators and what benefits they bring to our experiments. So if you've come to this video, we're going to assume that you have some knowledge about EPR or ESR. Uh, if you'd like to know more about our specific project with the Laird Group at Lancaster University, then you can check out our previous video on our EPR spectrometer. So we use a liquid sample in a vacuum tube, and this is how our resonator sits on that tube. For context, here is our EPR spectrometer. This is how the sample and resonator fit inside the spectrometer where the resonator is inductively coupled to the coupling loop. So the frequency that we're working at is around 40 MHz, which is a radio frequency, unlike the more commonly used microwave or above frequencies of standard EPR. So a microwave frequency EPR experiment would use a resonance cavity to deliver power to the sample, but we cannot use this because our wavelength is far too long. So instead, what we use is a modification on the loop gap resonator, Loop gap resonators are used for X-band EPR and consist of a loop of copper which acts as an inductor and a gap of air which acts as a capacitor. So how we've modified this is that we've added extra capacitors across the gap which increases the capacitance and therefore reduces the frequency. Unfortunately, there are a lot of limitations associated with these resonators. Primarily, the loaded quality factor is very low, and this means that when we're taking EPR measurements, there is a line width broadening and the signal to noise is not good. Uh, another issue that we found is that it's very hard to manufacture these resonators to a precise frequency as we want to. So for a single loop of given dimensions like we're using, we cannot change the inductance and that means that we're wholly relying on changing the capacitance to get our desired frequency. And this means that we're essentially limited by the values of capacitors that we have. Um, another issue we found is that even once you have that precise frequency, it's not necessarily going to stay at that frequency over time, we found that our resonant frequency drifted. And we do not have an explanation for why this is, so if you have any ideas, please let us know. Um, and the final issue we had is that in order to produce these, we need to solder the capacitors to the copper, which is quite difficult as the copper will act as a heat sink and therefore make the soldering impractical. When looking at increasing the Q factor for his experiments, our team member Andrew, who you may know from the channel, designed these solenoidal resonators with inductive coupling in mind. So these are made of a coil of copper wire and are connected at both ends to the capacitors, which completes the circuit. We found that these resonators have a much higher Q factor, and this is because for the same resonant frequency, we can greatly increase the inductance and reduce the capacitance, which increases the Q factor as per this equation. And here are the resonator quality factors plotted against their resonant frequency in megahertz, where the modified loop gap resonators are shown in black and the solenoidal resonators are shown in red. It is evident that even the worst solenoidal resonator for a given frequency is still significantly better than the best loop gap resonator. You can also see that our solenoidal resonators are around three times higher in quality factor than the loop gap resonators. Some other benefits of the solenoidal resonators is that they are both easier to manufacture and easier to make at a precise frequency. The resonant frequency is dependent only on the capacitance and the inductance following this equation. For our resonators, we can then use the formula for the inductance of a solenoid. So mu0 is the vacuum permeability and A is the cross-sectional area of the solenoid. We keep this constant because we want to be able to slip the resonator on and off our sample tube. However, unlike the loop gap resonator, we are able to choose N, the number of turns, and L, the length. Together with the capacitance, this gives us three parameters with which we can tune our resonant frequency. This gives us a precision up to about 10 kHz as opposed to the 1 MHz of the loop gap resonator. 
If you'd like to see us making a solenoidal resonator, or if you just want to find out more detail about our EPR spectrometer, check out our previous video. We hope that you found this useful, and feel free to get in touch if you have any questions. Thanks for watching.